Hi. Just checking you can hear me. I can hear you. Good. Just got a little bit starting to join. How's everyone doing? Thank you. I've survived another week. Good. Anything changed in Biker? No, uh, I'm hoping to start meals on a Monday. How's how Sonny Cornwall, Andrew? It's actually a bit cloudy today. What? Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it, it, yeah, it's a bit overcast. We're not used to this. It's been glorious ever since we've been locked in. Must be a sign that we're due to be let out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's all good, mate. It's, uh, it's busy. Yeah. We were on the um and we were on the national news today. Apparently um a hotbed of universal claimants. Really? And a, and a desperately failing economy. I mean, could you believe that? <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Right. So is it universal credit claim claims are proportionately higher in Cornwall? Yes, yeah, it's just it's, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. Oh, it has everywhere, isn't it? But it's gone bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Um, and and again, the biggest problem is this is this new. It's the new poor thing. The loads yeah. of people that are on furlough that the businesses are now folding. Yeah. Um, so when they come off their furlough, there is no job. I heard a phrase, I've only heard it once so far. Uh, um, uh, zombie businesses. Uh, zombie businesses, yeah. oh, has yeah. anybody else said that? Um, so they can only, they only exist because all their staff are on furlough. Um, but they're already actually bust. Um, There's a lot of it around. It's, it's a countrywide problem for definite. It's just because we're so heavily tourist centric, I think, that, uh, that it's more apparent. Yeah. Well, it's nice to see some. Uh, I Always hesitate to say some old faces because people might get offended. But folk that have been on uh, on the gathering for a couple of months now, but we're all older than we were at the start of lockdown. Um, Hello, and some new folk. Hi, Jane. Uh, and I think I'm seeing some new folk on the call today, which is very nice. Um, so we're to start folk still joining. So we'll give, give people one or two minutes more before we kick off. Um, I'm in a different 
space in my house now. I'm in the loft, so I get a bit more peace and quiet. But the trouble is, it's sunny, so um, I can't actually see. No, I can see. Just about to see the screen. See how my babies are coming on. <laughs> oh my, what are they, Jane? They're little begonias. All different ones and they were from postage stamp cuttings where you chop a leaf up. Right. So they're doing really well and I've got one that put when the heating wasn't working for weeks and weeks in the winter and we were only heating one room this one bought it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it's dear. coming back to life. It's as cool well, as and has wonderful curly leaves when it gets up to be a big boy. So there's, there's the sign of hope. It's so nice having time to look after plants in spring. <laughs> and such a nice spring to be looking after plants. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we're just after two, so I think we'll make a start. So welcome everybody to Tuesday afternoon at two, and it's the gathering on the margins. Um, and really nice to have, uh, I was saying some old, old faces and some new faces. Uh, we've been doing this every week since the start of lockdown. Um, and it's really an opportunity for folk. Uh, we're all locked away in our different corners of the UK, um, from, yeah, from far north to far south. Uh, so gathering from the margins, from people uh, living on the margins, people working on the margins, people that might now feel they on the margins when didn't think that was the case two or three months ago. And um, yeah, um, each week we explore a different theme. Uh, and have a chat and um, this week uh, we are exploring the theme of imagining a better future beyond lockdown um, which we'll see how we get on because it, at some points personally I think it's quite hard to imagine anything better because uh, it's quite grim at the moment and at other points it thinks yeah there's some really interesting things going on that spark thoughts about well that's if that can happen now then maybe something something good can could come out of this uh, or maybe not out of this but we might be able to do something better um, and some people might have seen the phrase uh, build back better which is a conversation that, that some people are having about how we can maybe have a better society mm. whenever we come out of lockdown than the one we were in before lockdown, which wasn't exactly great, I have to say. Uh, so that's the kind of conversation we're having. Uh, and we've got some folk who've joined today to give us some thoughts to kick off the conversation. Uh, so we'll hear from them in a minute. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity, this is a kind of participatory space for everybody to have conversation. Uh, but the way we like to start uh, the gathering is with a little breakout uh, into small groups of um, probably about five people in each group, just to introduce you know, a chance for you to say hi to two or four other people on the call, who you are, where you're calling from, and a quick thought at the start about the question, share a story of what's given you hope during hope for the future during the lockdown. So what's given you some hope for the future during the lockdown? But as I say, it's like uh, three or four minutes. So it's don't go into a long story at this point. You'll get a chance to do that later. This is more uh, a quick thought and say hi. Uh, and then we'll crack on with the, the session. 
So um, I'll just put everybody into uh, breakout rooms. So there'll be four or five of you in a room, and when you click on uh, to join the room, uh, you've got uh, about four minutes in your room. So it's literally uh, 40 seconds each. So see you all soon.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, I said that was quite a quick uh, round of introduction. Um, before we get into the kind of uh, the topic, I just want to introduce and welcome Matt, who is our digital poet in residence. Um, and uh, Matt, do you want to say a bit about the, the poetry work that's going on and the workshop we've got coming up? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Matt. Um, and my role, I guess, is trying to take some of these discussions and things that are happening um, and bring those to a wider audience using creative means and specifically using poetry. Um, and using poetry as a way to empower um, and share stories. Um, and so if anyone's interested in that kind of thing, after this workshop at 3.30, if anyone's free, um, we're going to be doing a workshop looking at um, imagining better futures in creative writing. Um, and I guess trying to create some physical uh, objects or written objects that as a movement we can be working towards so that these conversations like last, that the ideas that people come up with um, like don't um, just go away tomorrow, that we kind of remember the things that brought up today. Um, and that can be like a, a goal to go towards in future. So if anyone wants to take part in that, then I'm going to be putting information about how to get involved with that, um, that workshop in the chat um, at some point. And yeah, it, it'd be cool to see you later. Um, I would thoroughly recommend that. Uh, for those that weren't on the gathering last week, we had a fantastic session about creativity um, with some really great, uh, Matt and a few other folk, more, more young people, uh, about uh, using creativity as a response to the crisis. Um, so if you want to have a look on our Facebook page or website, there's, there's stuff about that and a whole stream of stuff that's coming out around uh, creative responses. Uh, but on to, uh, so today we're looking at um, what next, and I want to ask Liam to kind of introduce this. Liam's been doing some work for us, thinking about, about the future, um, and uh, just today we've kind of launched a, a conversation paper. So Liam, do you want to kind of kick the conversation off? Hi, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'll be as brief as I can because we've, we've produced quite a long document with a lot of thoughts and questions about this. So that's going to be up on the website uh, and as a series of blogs. Um, so if people want to share, look afterwards, uh, that's you, that'd be very welcome. Um, so I'm just going to summarise some of the key points in our thinking about all of this at the moment. One of the things that has a strong feeling for us yeah. is this, this is what people in churches might call a kairos moment. Uh, Liam. It's a moment that demands that we respond to the signs of the times and what's happening around us uh, and that demands that we, Liam. we change and do things differently. And uh, that's Liam, I'm going to have to stop really you. Need to respond to, um, and we're looking at that from a church perspective. <laughs> uh, Liam, your sound is really awful. I, so I'm going to have to. Um, I slow down. No, if maybe if you log out and log, I'll go to I'll go to Barry now. But if you log out, can and you log hear back, me now? No, I think the the connection's really poor. Um, okay, while we try and get Liam sorted, I'm going to go to Barry. Barry Knight. Uh, from, uh, well, you're signed on the thing as our Adney Network. Barry, do you want to say a bit about the work that you've been doing through, uh, is it Rethinking Poverty? And the thoughts that you've had about uh, the future? Hang on a minute. Um, there we go. There you go. You're unmuted. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me clearly? Yep, that's clear. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to put in the chat the reference to the um, an article um, that I've written called Build Back Better, 
um, which is published on the um, Rethinking Poverty website. My, co my colleague Carolyn Hartnell is also on this call, making sure that I say the right thing. Um, she'll she'll uh, have words with me if I don't afterwards. She edits the site. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this article in the state of uh, the early stage of lockdown, um, feeling in absolute confusion, and um, you know, feeling that I'd experienced nothing like this in my life before, and partly because I haven't, and none of you have either, because this is the first time we've actually had a global pandemic. Um, we've lived through many disasters in the in the sort of 20th and 21st centuries. Um, the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, Hurricane Katrina, um, the financial crash of 2008, the Haiti uh, earthquake of 2010, the Nepal earthquake of um, 2015, the Puerto Rican hurricane in 2017, um, outbreaks of SARS, Ebola, cholera, uh, and other, other um, diseases. But this is the first time we've actually had a global pandemic since 1918, when 50 million people lost their lives across the world, and 228,000 in the UK lost their lives, which actually had devastating effects, as disasters always do. Uh, this one is going to be no different. Um, and I looked at the, uh, the literature on disaster relief and found that there are essentially three phases. There's the survival phase where people go into emergency rescue, the kind of resilience phase where people kind of get back to normal, and then there's the re reconstruction phase. And when I wrote this, um, I, I think it was published in, on April the 7th uh, on the website, um, we were very much in the uh, survival phase. People didn't know what was happening. Um, the article, I will have to say, has, has hit the headlines everywhere. It's been reposted. Um, it, there are two, um, two websites called Build Back Better. It's, it's been on the lips of politicians in the UK, in the Netherlands and other countries. People have, have really referred to this article. It's on billboards in Bristol. I don't know how this has happened, but people, it's sort of caught the moment. And I think one of the reasons why <clears throat> it's caught the moment is the use of the term Lyman, um, which is a term that may be unfamiliar to, but I've actually used a book, a Christian book called Guard the Chaos by um, two um, former members of the uh, Anglican religious order that actually left the church and they talked about their chaos using Christian language and it might be worth you, those of you who are, uh, are interested in that, looking at that. But it talks about the Lyman as a, a, a zone of change in which time feels elongated, where there are feelings of panic, fear, loss and confusion and we fear that total collapse of everything we know and we hold dear and we just want to go back to the way things were. Although, as Neil said in the beginning, things were not that great. And really the task of Build Back Better is to use the crisis for actually building the kind of world we want to see. And there are lots of people already building the work they want to see. And I suspect it's not the kind of work that you want to see. And Naomi Klein in her book, The Shock Doctrine, talks about disaster capitalism and how um, when something really bad happens, uh, people, and she uses the example of New Orleans and the 2005 um, uh, flood there, that capitalists use that opportunity to make a lot of money. Hedge funds use the collapse in asset prices to buy up assets really cheaply and then inflate them. Governments use uh, um, the opportunity to get through laws 
um, that they wouldn't normally get through. At the moment, President Trump is engaged in a whole series of legislation to deregulate various forms of um, uh, in environmental protection. So the critical thing is how do we actually begin to challenge that and think about that differently? Because the good news about a crisis and the, the, these two authors, Hannah Ward and Jennifer Ward, Ward, uh, Hannah Ward and Jennifer Wilde in Guard the Chaos, talk about the wilderness, uh, the, the 40 days of um, Christ in the wilderness as a time of preparation, a separate state, a sacred space where people can actually build back better, can think differently and can uh, um, um, think about how the kind of world, world they want to have. Um, and I've been over the past few weeks talking to people across the world and there are two key words that come um, uh, from those conversations. The first is vulnerability, that regardless of who you are, people feel vulnerable in this crisis. And that is not a weakness, that is a strength, because vulnerability puts us in touch with our essential humanness, our essential quality of what it is to be alive. And those of you who've read the novel The Plague by, Alf Alfred, um, by uh, Albert Camus, I mean, his message is that human beings are vulnerable. The plague is always with us and that we really need to engage with the things that really matter in life. Protection of goods, protection of careers, protection of wealth, of money does not take us, was, does not protect us from the plague. And what really matters in the play is the second word that I have heard time and time again during conversations all across the world is relationship. What is really matters in life is our relationships. And the critical thing we need to do, I think, around this crisis is to begin to reevaluate re re our relationships in different kinds of ways. Not the I need to do this, the I of the ego, the logo of the organization, or the silo of the particular field that we're working in, but actually to abolish all that and th connect with each other through the kinds of attitudes and, and, and beliefs that lead to the sense of community that many of you talked um, about in your introductions, at least our little small group, stressed the word of what was happening in their communities. And that is really uh, at the heart of it. And it really, we need to build a new model of power. The feminist, early feminist author, more than a hundred years ago, Mary Parker Follett wrote, wrote about two models of power. She talked about power over where power is something which is actually held by one person, but not by another. And what she said was, we don't want power over, we want power with, where power is actually negotiated within relationships of equality. So that power is something that is built between people rather than held over people. And at the root of our societal problems is the vast inequalities that have been growing ever since 1977 and have been encouraged either explicitly or implicitly by various governments. And that what really happens now is we need to organize on the ground through our communities, through our churches, through our mosques, through our institutions of civil society to begin to stand up to that kind of power. Because as we build back better, the forces against us are greater than the forces for us. So that it's a, a question of really organizing and progressive people have a very poor history of organizing. If you think about the institutions of the left, trade unions are, are, are non-existent. The political parties are in disarray. Um, the 
civil society is is stepping forward but its funding base is really weak philanthropy doesn't can't get its act together we really need to rebuild the agency of our societies from the grassroots where which is where organizations like like your yours church action on poverty have a really critical role to play in actually beginning to organize not on uh, the the ego the logo or the silo but actually using a model of power with because unless we do that unless we begin to think about different kinds of attitudes we will simply go back to the default tr position which is what happened in 2008 where the banks built back stronger it's this time communities need to build back better thank you thanks so much Barry oh lots to go on there um, before we get into the conversation, there's two other people I want to invite to say a few words. Um, next, I want to ask uh, Paul Cook from uh, Tear Fund. Um, Tear Fund's had a little uh, think piece of your own called Reboot. So do you want to share some thinking? Uh, and Tear Fund obviously work both globally and in the UK. So there's an interesting perspective there about uh, how might we build back better for people struggling against poverty. Uh, all across the, the globe. So Paul. Absolutely, thanks very much. Well just to share a few thoughts, um, those who don't know Tear Fund, so we're a Christian relief and development agency uh, working in about 50 different countries across Africa, Asia and Latin America and the main way we work is through local churches wherever we can, so similar to some of the comments that already been made really key to you know those living at the, at the local level are those who've got the best understanding of poverty in their doorstep and have got the best solutions to it so how do we work through them and through the local churches as much as we can to tackle poverty in the UK and overseas uh, that people find on their doorsteps um, as as you know the kind of the impact of COVID-19 on the poorest countries is already being felt and is going to be a heck of a lot worse as we go forward so um, you know the, the potential impact is kind of huge in countries with very limited health systems, um, you know, virtually no testing. I was talking with colleagues in Kenya, they said sort of 50% of you know, the country's on lockdown, but 50% um, of the population earn in the day what they eat in the evening. So, um, you know, there's no way they can do that. They'll starve to death. So they, they have no choice but to sort of break the law and go out, try and find work. Uh, or another colleague in Haiti was talking about there's only one hospital in the whole country that's got an intensive care unit. So, you know, imagining sort of dealing with these kind of crises and those kind of situations. So it's pretty tough. Um, at the same time, um, I think, you know, there are some big opportunities for change. So I very much agree with everything that's just been shared and that's very much shares our thinking and I've shared the paper in the chat as well. That these moments of crisis are sort of opportunities for change. So we've seen that in the past, so we see with shocks, so things like the First World War, so as we know, in the UK coming back from that, uh, it was not long after that that women that's got the vote and all that, all the social change that came with that and a lot of the uh, bases of the welfare state being built in and strengthened at that time. And similarly, after the Second World War with the, the NHS and uh, welfare state, again, being sort of built in much more strongly, uh, these kind of shock moments create these opportunities. And again, we had, as always been already been said, there was another shock moment in um, 2009 with the financial crisis where this opportunity that we largely squandered to come back and build a better and a different world. Uh, I maybe have some hope that similar to maybe the, the World War One and World War Two examples, if we get through this, it really will be because people have worked together and actually the parts of society, as it says in the Bible, you know, the parts that the body that often we gave the least respect to turn out to be um, the most essential. So it's kind of nurses and healthcare workers and drivers and food delivery people will turn out to be much more useful than uh, management consultants and lawyers and, and various others. So it'd be an interesting to see how that carries through into these discussions afterwards. So we launched this paper called The World Rebooted that I've uh, put in there, which is really a, a very short discussion paper for churches, asking a lot of these same kind of questions. What, what sort of the world do we want to go back to? Do we just want to go back to where we were before uh, as quickly as possible, or do we want to go back to something different? Um, and we also have with that a short film and a sort of discussion guide. I'll just put the link for that into the chat as well. Um, and we think there's maybe three shifts going on in society at the moment. So firstly, a shift from much more individualism to a sense of togetherness. 
So as I was mentioning, you know, we're definitely rediscovering value, the, the numbers of people who are volunteering or helping out neighbours, being communities coming out once a week to applaud health workers uh, and various other things like that. So very much seeing, you know, people pulling together. I, know, I don't know about you, but some of our local churches have their best attendance rates ever. Um, so people sort of coming together online and doing creative things. So there's a real sense of, sort of togetherness, which I think we can build on. It's an encouraging sign. Um, I think it's interesting there's a, maybe a shift from valuing sort of economic productivity above everything else, having a greater value for life. So we, we've made sort of very big and difficult, painful economic decisions in order to preserve life um, as a nation over the last few months and weeks. Of course, they're going to have knock-on impacts to people's lives as well. So there's lots to debate in that. But I think at an individual level as well, it's amazing how people by and large have been happy to, to take a lot of personal economic pain in order to support the greater good and to help those who are most vulnerable. And um, so there's something encouraging in that, I think, that we can build on. And again, I think there is an appetite out there. So a third shift from just small tweaks to actually a much more open uh, understanding and interest in a different way of being. There was a, a Maury poll a few weeks ago that said uh, they found that only 9% of Brits said they wanted to go back <clears throat> to exactly where they were before and the rest said they wanted to go back to something different. So I think that's, that's quite an encouraging poll. Um, you see in the Archbishop of Canterbury's Easter message, it talked about that we can't go back to where we were before we're going to discover our common life together. So again, there's a real sense of wanting to go back to something different to discover something different. Um, so we think there's a, there's a threat in all of that. So as has already been said, you know, there's a danger. We just race to get back to business as usual as quickly as we possibly can. And that we, we just go back to where we were before. And with all the issues of inequality that we mentioned for us, the issues of the environment and climate are really key because we see those having an impact on the poorest people in the world. Uh, and actually, do we just go back and start bailing out fossil fuel industries as fast as we can and get back to consumption? Is it like the financial crisis where, you know, to get the economy going, we've all just got to get out there and spend, 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 and consume, consume, consume. Is that is that the answer? A friend of mine wrote another blog at the time that said, "Surely we've got to have a message, a better message than only shopping can save us now." You know, that surely that's not the world we want to go back to. There's got to be more we have to offer than that. Uh, and inequality increasing, and, and of course the debt burden coming out of all of this. There's definitely threats. It's not a you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that we'll go back to something different and better. The real threats will go back you know, to where we were before or worse. Um, but there are real opportunities as well. As I say, there's a real opportunity for, um, we're particularly looking at a green and fair recovery. So as we get the economy going again, we get it going in ways that are environmentally sustainable and that uh, see better uh, working conditions and, and salaries for all people, uh, less inequality. So ways that we restart our economy along much healthier lines, uh, real opportunities there. And actually do a lot of the things that we should have been doing anyway to tackle climate change and environmental crisis and we just to close we had suggested three questions for church groups to look at and i'll get off these in the chat now um what do you hope the new normal for society will be like what things do you hope will change as a result of this what part can you and your church play in that and then particularly looking at the issues of climate change so it's been interesting for those of us who've been campaigning on climate change for years and being told all these things are politically impossible, we suddenly find that in a very short space of time, we can build massive hospitals, we can turn over all the private hospitals in the country to the NHS, and we can find billions and billions and billions down the back of a sofa somewhere to, to support the economy, which we couldn't have done any of that before, apparently. So it definitely shows that, you know, significant change at speed, at scale is possible. So how do we take encouragement from what we can achieve and actually uh, push into some of the things we need to do next? So there we go, a few thoughts, looking forward to the discussion. Hope that's helpful. Excellent, thanks Paul. Um, yeah, some applause there, that's great. Um, so Emma, uh, I want to come to you now. Emma from the Student Christian Movement, so a different organisation, different perspective. Uh, Emma wrote a little blog, or oh, a little blog, I shouldn't, uh, a blog on the new normal. So do you want to say, maybe slightly briefer, but a few of the thoughts that you put in there, which were quite interesting to share. Right. Sure, yes. Um, yeah, I'll share, share briefly what was in there. Can you hear me okay? Am I? Yep, you're good. Lovely. Um, so yeah, I'm Emma. I work for the Student Christian Movement um, and we've been encouraging students to use theological reflection and to um, think through, uh, my, the project I lead is called the Faith in Action Project. So I think through how they can put their faith into action in dealing with uh, crises, well, 
before this, such as global warming and uh, well, poverty and things like that, but now also the, the coronavirus. Um, so yeah, a lot of what was in my blog has already been said, but I'll just summarise the key points. So I was looking at it through the lens of community development. Um, I've been reading a lot recently about Paulo Freire and um, what he taught about critical pedagogy. So um, encouraging people and communities through learning together to see the injustices and contradictions in our society through, with fresh eyes and to see how their individual struggles are linked to um, structural inequalities and structural injustices rather than just being the, the problem of the individual. Um, so three things I identified that come out of the coronavirus situation that can help us with that um, community development and that critical pedagogy where um, firstly an increased awareness of connection and um, so an increased awareness of our local communities. Um, I certainly being stuck at home more noticed more about the place that I'm in and the people around where I am, the people around us who keep our societies running and the way that just a slight shift or a slight change in um, in the way things run can leave us without food on our shelves and uh, without our basic kind of services being provided. Um, so an increased awareness that we're not individuals, we do function as societies and community is really necessary for our continued um, functioning. Um, the second thing is an increased awareness of inequality. I think the, um, there's been a lot of rhetoric about coronavirus being the great leveller and us all being in the same boat. And I think actually uh, coronavirus is showing us the complete opposite of that, that um, the situation you're in and uh, the inequalities that were already inherent in our society have had a huge impact on how coronavirus affects you. And it, it really makes um, those inequalities a matter of life and death. Um, so an increased awareness of those and the third thing I think is a decreased sense of normality I think uh, whereas normally we kind of what Paulo Ferro says is we, we become kind of blind to the contradictions that are in our society we, we become so used to the way things are that we don't manage to see past that to see anything better or to see that anything different is possible so I think um, something that can come out of this is that we can use that kind of lack of sense of normality, the feeling that um, you were talking about, the, the being in a liminal space, the feeling that everything's a bit up in the air, to actually really question um, what parts of normality we want to go back to and what parts we really um, want to and are able to change, as Paul was saying, the, the change that is possible when we actually put our minds to it and actually when the government want to see that change. Um, so yeah, that's what I was saying in my blog. I think this is a really key time to develop those community relationships and community learning um, and see see how we can progress from there. Thanks, Emma. Um, so three uh, quite different perspectives, but lots of uh, commonalities. Um, so now for the next um, just under 15 minutes, uh, we're going to go into back in, largely back into the same groups. Um, and I'm giving you just one question because it's uh, that's quite a big enough question. Uh, what do you hope the new normal for society will be like? So it's uh, Paul's first question. Uh, what things do you hope will change as a result of this time locally, nationally or globally? Um, and you've got 10 minutes to come up with the answers. So no, no pressure there. Uh, the two things I'd say is make sure everybody has an opportunity to, to contribute. Um, and secondly, if in your little group you want to agree one person that will just feed back some of the thoughts uh, when we come back together um, so I'll uh, invite you all to go into your rooms and have that conversation for the next uh, 15 minutes or so so in enjoy
I pressed a thing, I didn't mean to do that. Hello anyway. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, Liam's just shared in the chat the, uh, the document that we've just put out, uh, new wines, uh, new wineskins. I might ask Liam to see if he can say a few words, but before we get onto that, does anybody want to share a few thoughts from your conversations? Maybe an idea that hasn't, hasn't come up in the, in, the, in the presentations or something that sparked off in your group that you think would be interesting to share? Ben, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, not really. Um, it was sort of feedback from everybody in the group, but yeah. um, we talked about sort of prevention around mental health and well-being, and about um, how the last ten years have seen lots of kind of firefighting uh, to some of um, the underlying um, issues that uh, vulnerable people have, and about how moving forward we need to ensure that some of the preventative measures and the more holistic approaches um, are something um, that we focus on. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Raj, you've got your hand up. Uh, I mean, we had a discussion in my group and I just was trying to say, I'm at discomfort using the word new normal because what is this newness that we are adding to the normal are we starting with a clean slate to do something different or are we trying to carry this ruggedness of the normal, the patchiness of the normal, the infections of the normal, and then try to see if we can reimagine. So I was trying to say, is this new as an adjective, trying to take out the creativity from us or is it adding into our reimagining of the story or reimagining or doing things into the regular normal. Well, that's a whole conversation in itself, Raj. Maybe that's another session. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that, uh, but that's no, it's great. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a whole conversation to be had about where does imagination, the role of imagination, you know, imagining things completely different from how they are now. Um, but yeah, let's not get quite into that one with five minutes left to go. Does anybody else from another group want to feed back some thoughts? Uh, Liam. Can you hear me this time? Yeah. Ah, I've switched laptops. It's obviously a laptop problem. Um, yeah, just briefly, because I'm going to be talking in a minute, aren't I? But I think the interesting things from our group, we talked about the need to, hello, uh, the need to make uh, in our response, but the decisions that we need to make should be made uh, locally as far as possible and by the people who are affected and we talked about the tools that we have in our networks already for doing that kind of thing like the the participatory budgeting that church action on poverty used to do what are the tools that we have that are there ready and that we could be offering and trying to encourage them to use in the response i think that was a, an interesting question we talked about yep anybody else andrew I'll just be brief. Yeah, just one thing I I mentioned to the group was that um, I'm slightly concerned that we talk about a new normal, but if we take our eye off the ball for much longer, we're already being forced very much back to the old normal, where the word food bank was already. It, it, all of this stuff is already being buried by the government as we come out of lockdown. So the, the fact of all the environmental factors, we're already being stage one. Drive as far as you like, use as much fuel as you like, which will generate as much tax as we can. We're already not talking about food banks. We're already not talking about the food poor. It's if we want any hope of any change to, and actually, yeah, what is the new normal? It's a fantastic question, to be honest. Um, we need to be awfully aware that, that it might well be too late to try and change anything if we don't hurry up. 
And, and I was just planning on my car trip down to Cornwall next week, Andrew. So I That's different. That <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was shit. That's wicked thought. Anyway, um, Jim. Yeah, quick, I, quick point. Roger's already spoken for the group, but the, the point was raised in our group as to whether, at a local level, people do have the confidence, uh, or how do we help? people gain the confidence to 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 work for uh, changes in the future and in some ways we're I mean, trying to link that to Barry's comment which very helpful in terms of of relationships what how do we help people gain the confidence particularly at the margins to actually to remake and renew and reorganize previous relationships that they have how how, how can that happen I don't know whether Benedict would want to argue that from her very active local situation. Bernie, do you want to come in there? Okay. You're okay to talk now? Um, I've unmuted you, Bernie, you can talk. I think people locally are very um, lacking in confidence and um, and can't and can't imagine a different life because they're so busy trying to get through the life they're having to lead at the moment and i was quite frightened by what andrew's just said about it might be almost too late um because one of the things i was thinking about i, I am involved with the food bank that we have so much goodwill in our community trying to help one another and um and i think I was wondering myself about the tools we have, whether, you know, through using our Facebook networks and our Twitter networks, there are ways of kind of getting people to start asking these questions um, because I haven't seen them being asked because we're so busy trying to survive at the moment still and helping people that we're kind of, we haven't had time to lift our heads up mm. and ask what's in front of us. I think that's partly why we were keen to have this, this session now to you know that there are people exploring these ideas now and it's important that we don't leave the task. Um, but my view is we're still in the early phases. It, I mean, it's not a great thought, but we're only two or three months into the crisis. And we know even when, when well, whatever lockdown ends, we're going to enter a period of a long recession. So I, I think this is going to be with us for years. So um, that's not a cheery thought, but it means it's not like we've got to come up with the answers this week. Uh, otherwise, we'd miss the boat. Um, Pat, were you wanting to, to add something? Yeah, I just, um, I think this is a really important conversation to have. And I think in the time that we've had, we've only really been able to scratch the surface. And lots of people have had some really valuable and interesting contributions. And I was wondering if for the future we could maybe plan a, a series of three or something on this topic, you know, and explore a bit further some of the inputs and maybe other inputs and have a bit longer to share with each other as well. That's that's a good thought. Um, we've got the themes for the next two weeks yeah. kind of lined up, but beyond that, yeah. we could we could make this the theme for no, two or three more sessions. Um, yeah. I was conscious we've had three great inputs, but it has squeezed the time for conversation. And a lot of the ideas uh, we've been just touched on, we could have a whole session just on you know, one of the themes. That yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, um, if, if people are up, up for that, um, we can plan uh, and come back to some of the themes. And maybe if you've got thoughts on what particular themes you think would be good to, to work on, then you could feed that through to uh, to any of us in the team, um, and we'll mull on how to how to construct, you know, what how to how to break it down a bit. Um, I think we are coming a bit to you know coming up to the time. So Liam, do you want to just share a few last thoughts and and how the paper that we've launched can kind of help help in that process? Uh, yeah, uh, the paper's now in the discussion doc. Uh, in the chat thing here so you can download that and comment on it and it's meant to start a conversation so we'd like to hear what you've got to say it's going up as a series of blogs on our website this week as well so you can comment there and um 
I think it's it's really encouraging to hear how much overlap there is between what we've been doing and what Barry was saying and what Tear Fund have been doing and Emma's uh, input. We're we're pulling in the same direction. We have a vision that we share here, uh, and a lot of our document is about how we communicate that vision and try and have an influence on what happens. So the particular things we're bringing, we're thinking about what the faith perspective on this is. What are the stories in our faith and our tradition that are useful? So we talked about it being a Kairos moment. We talked about whether this is a chance for a jubilee when you set things back and reset the injustices and have a fresh start. So what, what can we as a faith community bring to that is an interesting question for us. And we're also thinking about how we communicate about this in a way that really connects with people. Um, We've been doing a lot of work with Joseph Rowntree Foundation on how you frame poverty. And we're thinking, how do we frame this? And we're thinking we need to talk about this as a journey that we're all on together. And we need to communicate to people the urgency of action, but also the fact that this is possible. This is within our grasp. And the responses we've seen on our streets and in our communities show us what we need to do to build a better world afterwards. So that's kind of the key things where we are, but we'd really welcome comments and feedback and a conversation about all of this. So have a look at the document, please. Okay, thanks everybody. We do have a wheel to try and finish um, pretty much within the hour because otherwise you get zoomed out. Um, so thanks everybody. Uh, next week, the theme is, um, and it's one of the ideas that people have found quite uh, energizing from the lockdown is mutual aid, the growth of mutual aid and how we, the communities can be resilient. And I think people in low income communities can tell the rest of us a lot about how to be resilient uh, in, in the midst of difficult circumstances. Uh, the week after, uh, we've got a focus on young people to hear from and uh, engage with the experience of young people. Again, hit hard by the economic crisis and by the lockdown. Um, and you know, young people weren't having a great time in many cases uh, in the old normal. Um, we were then thinking the next week to have a look, uh, touching a bit on some of what Paul's been talking about, about uh, global solidarity. Um, there's an event coming up in the middle of June in the States called the Poor People's Movement, uh, a big uh, event to try and get poverty on the US agenda and a mobilisation across across the states. So we're seeing whether we can get somebody from there to come and share what they're doing and maybe some other perspectives from, from elsewhere to say, well, what this is a crisis that is affecting people in poverty and on the margins uh, everywhere. And what would a global solidarity movement look like? And what would our role um, be within a kind of, in that space? And that could also then, touching on what Pat said, be a conversation about how we could build that as a global movement. So that would be part of the, potentially the way forward. But beyond that, there are no plans. So we will then, uh, happy to hear any ideas about specific themes and ways of having this conversation about, uh, not using the word the new normal now, not going to do that, um, but how, and I'm, I'm not, um, it's still working out what the, what the language is to have the conversation, but how we can actually create a better world uh, where there won't be folk on the margins and there won't be margins and uh, we can uh, value people's dignity and maybe even live in a world free from poverty, but uh, that feels like a long way away at the moment. Anyway, thank you for all taking part. Uh, thank you to the folk that have joined us particularly for the conversation and you're all welcome back. Uh, next week or any week at 2pm uh, for another uh, gathering at the margins. So um, see you all again soon. Mark, can I just say very quickly, do, do follow the links uh, from the Tier Fund stuff if you want to find out more. And also, um, we're also launching a campaign next week around uh, green and fair recovery and what that would look like and Great. our sort of proposals. And as Barry and others were saying on the call, we're really keen to do that, you know, to work in collaboration with us. So we're all on the same side here. So as much yeah. as we can work up with you guys, we'd love to. But do follow the links if you'd like to find out it's one practical way of taking these forward. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. And Thanks for the invite. Lots, uh, it's been a great session. Great. And there's lots of links in the chat. So if you want to uh, have a look at those links before you log off uh, and copy any that you really want. Um, there's, there's, there's also, don't forget, Matt's uh, session on responding to the crisis through poetry, which is at 3.30. Is that right, Matt? Yep. 
So uh, if, you, if you're not completely zoomed out, you can go and have a cup of tea and then go and do some creative uh, poetry and spoken word. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Um, great to see you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks very much, Niall. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite inspiring to ask Barry Knight. <laughs> Had you come across him before? Oh no, he just lives along the road from me. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but uh, assuming it's all kind of quiet, it, it's actually the first. It's the first time. I, I think I'm confident to say ever that you know the kind of praise for the kind of faith organisations and the plug for for CAP, you know, because yeah. some publications in the past have never quoted anything from our stuff, you know. Mm. So I was really uh, encouraged by that same <laughs> movement. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm trying to speak to Fidge, so I'll get back to you with Iona. Okay. For a right. Right. So thanks very much again. Now. Okay. All right. You're fine. Take care. And you.